Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and this week we are talking about the business of healthcare. Always an interesting topic, and one we always like to dig into on this show is it eats up a larger and larger share of the uh, Rhode Island economy and the national economy. And joining me today to talk about that is Peter Marino. You might recognize Pete from his many years of service in and out of state government. You were the head of the Office of Management and Budget, et cetera, but you are now the president and CEO of Neighborhood Health Plan of Rhode Island. Welcome, Pete. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thanks for being with me. And uh, do you miss uh, do you miss budget time of year up at the State House that you used to work on? I don't know if I miss it, but it is an exciting time because so many different choices are being made and policy choices are being laid out. So it's it's an exciting time. So they're very busy up there. But maybe sure. not the late nights at House Finance Committee meetings or Senate no. Finance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, but today you're here. We're going to talk about uh, neighborhood. Now, I think. I'm sure there are people at home who don't know a lot about Neighborhood Health Plan. They're familiar with Blue Cross, which has had such a large market share in Rhode Island health insurance for so long. Um, but can you give a little background on, on how Neighborhood came to be and, and what you do at Neighborhood Health Plan? Sure. Well, Neighborhood Health Plan of Rhode Island is a managed care organization. And what we're doing is we are a health plan. And we've been around for 20 years. Um, it was originally created through the health centers of the state. We have a, a, a number of health centers across That's the like state. like the Providence that, Community Health Center. Exactly, exactly. And they serve a number of folks who are more the at-risk populations of the state. And they needed a plan that would help them make sure that they can get strong pricing, make sure they can control costs, and had a good broker with the state to make sure that, that the issues of Medicaid work. Um, neighborhood serves nearly 170,000 people in Rhode Island now. I mean, that's about 16% of the state. That's a lot of folks, yeah. It is a lot of folks, um, but we serve them very well. One of the things that Neighborhood's been very successful at is really kind of containing costs and making sure that we can provide good quality healthcare services to folks at a price that taxpayers and the members can afford. And you mentioned taxpayers because, uh, as you sort of alluded to there, the bulk of neighborhoods business, all of it used to be, and we're going to talk about how that's changing, but was Medicaid, the state yep. slash federal health insurance program for lower income folks. Um, you know, is Medicaid, um, or let me rephrase that, how important is Medicaid today to neighborhood? How core is it to your business? Well, it's, it's core. We are a partner with the state. In yeah. order for the state to really effectuate the things that it wants to do with Medicaid, with its investments and helping over 240,000 people in the state, our neighborhood happens to serve 170,000 of them, um, they needed a good partner and neighborhood has really served that role well. Um, over the years, we've grown as investments and in moving folks into managed care because they recognize the success that it's demonstrated in the past. A really good example, Ted, is um, Right Care, which many people understand is one component of Medicaid, and that helps women and children that are below a certain income level, and it gets them access to health care. Over the last five years, essentially, we've kept that cost flat on a per member per month basis. So kind of in a business terms, if you're looking at it at a unit cost, we've kept that price point mm -hmm. flat, even though the number of folks in the program have grown. So managed care is able to help direct people to their primary care provider, whether it's through a health center or other providers, and help manage those costs. And I think you, you're talking about managed care. I, I'm sure there are people watching not too familiar with how Medicaid works in Rhode Island. If you are um, a person uh, on Medicaid managed care, is it basically the same as, as a person who has private insurance, whether that's from Blue Cross, Neighborhood, United, uh, top somebody else? Absolutely. Essentially, you have the same network as you would in any other insurer. Um, so if I were on Medicaid and I was walking into either a health center or any other provider, essentially, I'd make sure that I met my primary care provider. I'd make sure that I get my checkups. Or if I had a cold or something, I could go in and have them check me out. If I need refer referrals to a specialist, um, they can send me to the person that will you know, best suit me, and I get the same services. The difference with um, Neighborhood is that we're ranked among the top 10 in the nation as a Medicaid plan um, for quality. And I think that's an important distinction. We're ranked number five in the nation right now, and we've been in the top 10 for the last 12 years. What drives that? What are the key components that it's, have allowed you to get that high ranking? That's a great question because it's a couple things. One is as neighborhood thinks about the member first. We want to make sure that they get good access to quality health care. And that's been kind of like the mission to make sure that we achieve that. Um, second is that we pay attention to quality. We make sure that when we look at what's happening in our providers, um, and our health centers have been a great partner with that because they pay attention to quality as well, that that's a really common kind of denominator that we're trying to achieve. 
Um, you've also, Neighborhood, has been closely involved in the launch of Health Source RI, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare marketplace in Rhode Island. And I was so struck by the shift this year when, you, when the numbers came out from Health Source RI, because, of course, people have a choice when they use Health Source RI between different private insurance providers. On uh, These are folks not on Medicaid, people getting a private plan with maybe a subsidy. And uh, the first year, it was like 97% Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode mm-hmm. Island, as we saw, and uh, you know maybe no surprise people. This year, the second year, 49% of the people chose Neighborhood Health Plan, up from 3% left, 3% to 49%. That is a huge huge shift in market share on Health Source RI. What drove that this year for Neighborhood? Well, I think it's a combination of things. First and foremost, Neighborhood looked at the exchange as an extension of its existing mission. There's a lot of folks who aren't eligible for Medicaid, but are struggling nonetheless. You know, they may be working, but they can't quite get over the hump to be able to afford health care. And that's what the exchange is really about, to try to find a way to make it more affordable. And um, so that was our kind of our target audience, is to make sure we can help those folks as well. So that was our primary ch- reason to get into the exchange. And the reason that we've seen such success in a very short period of time is principally it is price sensitive. And so we tried to price our products in the commercial market just in this exchange in a place that we could attract and bring the folks who are really struggling with their pocketbooks and make sure that they had access to a good quality health plan. And I think that's what's happened. You know, you, like you said, yes, there's been a shift in the membership and about 40, 43 percent of the folks that were in the exchange last year moved over to neighborhood, but nearly two out of every three folks that came into the exchange for the first time chose neighborhood. And I think it really demonstrates that it's really about price sensitivity, and we're going to work very hard to make sure we can maintain an affordable price for folks. We're talking about uh, there, uh, again, people maybe on the lower side of the income scale. There are folks who think, we don't need insurers at all in this area. You know, why don't, why don't we just have, you know, the government, if they're going to be helping to pay for these people health care, just do it fee for service, they pay for it, no insurance involvement at all. What's your case for why the insurers can make a positive difference in this marketplace, as opposed to just being a middleman who, you know, takes some extra money that could go to something else? Right, that's true, but a couple of things you should know is that we're a very efficient operation as well. Only 7% of our resources go to the administration of the plan itself, so that's number one. Number two, managed care allows us to make sure that you get the care you need when you need it um, at a price that makes sense. If you leave it to fee-for-service, and that's one of the struggling issues that the state is dealing with right now with the Medicaid task force that Governor Raimondo is kind of spearheading, is that fee-for-service is volume-driven and it doesn't necessarily allow you to help control costs. And that's where managed care really hits the you know, rubber with, you know, on the road, so to speak. It really makes a difference. And it allows us to interact with the member to make sure that they're getting the services they need. But also, if they don't need the service, we can also make mm-hmm. sure that they aren't duplicative in the nature of the, what they're doing. So going back to that shift in, in neighborhood, adding commercial insurance for the first time when the exchange, when Health Source RI launched, um, what, uh, what's it taken for neighborhood to adjust to having commercial mm-hmm. insurance, non-Medicaid insurance for the first time? I mean, how big a shift has that been for the company? Well, we've certainly had to make some investments in terms of some of the technology and manpower, so to speak. But it's actually a natural extension extension of where we were. Because of the nature of who was attracted to the neighborhood product in the, in the commercial market, they're very similar in a lot of ways to the folks that we serve now in Medicaid. So it really wasn't that difficult for us to kind of extend our circle of influence, so to speak, to bring those folks in to make sure that they're going to get the services they need. The key really is the customer service, is making sure folks understand that we're there to make sure that they get access to the care they need, but at a price that they can afford. State officials did have some trepidation, I know, about neighborhood joining the commercial insurance market because neighborhood's so crucial to how Medicaid is delivered mm-hmm. in the state when you, when you folks were looking at that. And I know that was actually before you joined as CEO. Um, the worry, I think, was about the financial stability mm-hmm. of, um, of neighborhood, whether that would jeopardize that at all. So how, how are neighborhood's finances today after adding those commercial people and, and adding a lot more Medicaid people as well? Okay. Well, first, the financial condition of neighborhood was very strong before we got into the commercial market. And it's as strong if not stronger since we've gotten into the market. Uh, We have fairly strong reserves and they continue to grow. As you can imagine, in my prior role as OMB director, I look at finances very carefully. That was the first question I had when I was exploring this option. Um, Are our reserves strong enough? And They are and they continue. The state certainly certainly pays attention to our reserves. Um, But don't forget, 15,000 members is 15,000 out of 170,000 members. And that's you're saying the private plan people versus the Medicaid people. Exactly. So, you know, it it is a, a significant new membership for us, but our bread and butter is the Medicaid program, and so I'm not too concerned about the financial implications of the commercial market. 
All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, and uh, Pete alluded to it, a good tease, as we say in television, the Medicaid Working Group, Governor Raimondo's effort to cut some spending out of that. This man is on that working group, so we're going to ask how it's going and what to expect. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we are talking this week with Peter Marino. He is the fairly new. What, to, what month last year did you take over? In September. In September. Okay, so still pretty new to the job, but I uh, got some months under his belt. Uh, CEO and president of Neighborhood Health Plan of Rhode Island, which is one of the state's larger insurers, 170,000 people enrolled, mostly in the state's Medicaid program, though they're getting into the commercial market too, which we were talking about before. But uh, going back, uh, to, or actually before we go more on Medicaid, I actually want to ask you more about Health Source RI. Mm -hmm. The uh, as you mentioned, the exchange, the marketplace that Rhode Island set up to run um, to run Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act here, and sell plans. Um, how do you think it's working overall, Health Source RI, technically and, and in terms of carrying out its mission? Well, I think, like across the country, all the exchanges are struggling a little bit to get their feet underneath them. But I think Rhode Island's actually been fairly successful. Um, certainly has its challenges, um, but I think we've been successful in getting over thirty thousand lives enrolled through the exchange. Um, I think the new director, I think she's going to um, bring a, a, new, a new perspective on how to operate the exchange. And um, Neighborhood is a not only a willing but an eager partner in the exchange. So I'm excited about and it. And Anya Wallach, the new uh, director, she'll actually be joining us on the show in a few weeks. But um, I know she suggested since she took over in January that there were some fairly serious technical problems she found mm -hmm. happening with Health Source. Sorry. Has Neighborhood seen evidence of that? Has it affected you at all? Well, we continue to work with them. It's a partnership. We have to make sure that our technology is speaking the same language with theirs and that they, that can go back and forth. So I think that, that will work its way out. That's It'll take some time, but that's okay. Um, but more importantly, I think what um, Director Wallach has really done is really thought about, okay, what's, a, what's the scale of the exchange and what is affordable to Rhode Island? And I think she's done a nice job of reshaping that to a place where people can get a higher comfort level and where the exchange can go. Um, and that actually leads right to my next question. Does Neighborhood take a position on this debate about should Rhode Island keep Health Source RI or potentially move to the federal healthcare.gov system? What do you think is better? Um, we're absolutely absolutely in the camp of a state-run exchange. I think, one, it gives the state a little bit more flexibility in policy setting rather than abdicating that to the federal government. But more importantly, it also allows us to control costs. Mm -hmm. So if we're serious about going forward with an exchange and we look at it down the path, we want to make sure that it's affordable. And it gives us a little bit more options on how we want to finance it and how we want to structure it. You've been on both sides of this. You were a state budget um, uh, OMB director, and now you're a health insurance CEO. $11 million for the exchange still strikes some folks. Wow, that's a lot of money for the number of lives that go through there. I mean, do you think, is that the amount that's needed to do what it should be doing? Well, I certainly think that the director was much more responsive to the reaction to proposed budgets in the past. And I think scaling it back to a certain level, $11 million certainly sounds like a lot of money. There's a heavy technology investment in the exchange. And so that needs to be taken care of and done well. You want to make sure you make those investments properly. Um, but more importantly, I think it's a recognition that you have to scale this to the level of the number of lives you're going to serve. And as this grows, and I think most people expect it, if it continues to go the path that it is, it'll continue to grow. And we're, we're excited about that, and we're very supportive of the direction it's going. Meanwhile, a huge part of HealthSource RI and the rollout of the health law has been more people joining Medicaid, which we've been talking yeah. about, as they expanded who was eligible to, uh, to get Medicaid coverage in Rhode Island and in most st many states across the country. So how much has neighborhoods Medicaid enrollment grown uh, based on the expansion of Medicaid eligibility? Yeah, well, the Affordable Care Act had provisions and allowed states to choose whether or not they wanted to expand Medicaid, and Rhode Island did that. And it's had a number of impacts. One, it's brought a significant amount of federal dollars to the state. About a half a billion dollars of federal money is flowing now into the state because of the expansion. Um, and that certainly had an impact on the overall health system and where we are. But to neighborhood, we've actually incurred, we've had a growth spurt, so to speak, for the expansion of over 50,000 folks. And that's, that's impressive. Um, we're trying to figure out exactly you know, what that means to us, but we've been very successful with the, with the Medicaid populations in the past, and we think that this is going to be great for us to make sure that these folks who used to show up in hospitals and other places without insurance, so those costs were incurred and nobody had any resources to pay for them, now they're getting their managed care. We can help make sure that they're seeing their primary care doctors and perhaps reduce the costs associated with them. So this is a huge growth for neighborhood when you put it all together. 15,000 people in private plans added from Health Source RI, 70, 000, or 50,000, excuse me, you said on Medicaid. Uh, you've become a much bigger company just in the last few years. Absolutely. We've experienced a lot of growth. Um, part of that is because we are a partner with the state and the state's made investments at neighborhood to say we want to make sure that you can help us control these costs. 
here you go, here are the resources and through Medicaid, but also we're going to hold you accountable for them. So we've demonstrated a good cost control structures, and I think that's been very valuable to the state. Um, you may know, I think some of your previous reports have demonstrated that over the past couple of years, actually Medicaid costs in the state, when you look at it a PM, PM basis, actually have declined. PM, PM being uh, yes. per member, per month, the yes. way to measure. Another kind of in a business sense, a unit cost, so to speak, yeah. right? And um, so we've actually seen decline, whereas nationally and at, at the commercial level, it's actually grown. Um, so I think that's important to note. Um, so I think neighborhood has played a significant role in managing those costs. I know that people are concerned about the Medicaid costs, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, I think, in a little bit. But um, we've demonstrated success. All right, we're going to take another break. When we come back, as you say, we're going to talk more about this Medicaid working group and its effort to reduce Medicaid costs in Rhode Island. We're also going to talk about a new effort that neighborhoods involved in to reduce how much nursing homes spend and they spent on the elderly in Rhode Island. So much more to talk about. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we're talking this week with the president and CEO of Neighborhood Health Plan of Rhode Island, major health insurer. They cover uh, about 170,000 Rhode Islanders. Peter Marino, and Pete, we, we keep alluding to it. Let's talk about it. Governor Raimondo has put together this task force, you're on it, to cut uh, about $45 million state funding for Medicaid, which is maybe gets to $90 million with the federal match on Medicaid. Um, how's its work going so far? Well, I, I think it's moving in the right direction. I think I commend the governor for kind of doing a call to arms, so to speak, to sign. How do we get our hands around the long-term costs associated with health care? Um, it's an interesting team that's been put around the table. It's big. It's like 27 people, it's right? It's something like that, yes. And it's got a whole kind of a good mix of folks that are, that are discussing the issues. And we've already had a couple of meetings. We've gone through a couple of meetings with public comment kind of thing. Um, the real work is really starting to really kind of start get going here. Um, there's a number of subcommittees that are working on issues related to behavioral health or long-term care. Um, and the staff at OHHS is being very supportive to make That's sure the Health that, and Human Services yes, Office. And they're, they're providing good support to make sure that folks have some good information to help make some key recommendations to the governor. Do you think the task force can meet the roughly April 30th deadline she set up? I think it's a challenge, but we haven't missed a meeting yet. So the, the movement is there. Um, I know that there's a, a goal to try to get information and recommendations to the governor so she can suggest some things in her budget, and we're trying to make sure that happens. I think more importantly, though, and I think the governor recognizes this, is that we have to look at this more long term. What are some of the opportunities to really ad to address issues of cost, but also make sure that we're doing that in a way that continues the access and continues the quality that's delivered to folks here. Somebody, though, has to not get $90 million <laughs> if these that's cuts true. are made, whether it's hospitals, nursing homes, doctors, somebody else, I don't know, the insurers somewhere, I don't know. Um, is there, can you classify at all what the panel's leaning toward? Is it going to come out of one sector more than another, do you think? No, I think the governor gave some general direction, but I think it's early to say where they think, where we're going to land as a committee. Um, I'm not sure that we're even actually going to vote on anything in particular. I think is here's some recommendations to explore. Here are some options and what they might generate for the state and what that might mean to the healthcare system. So I think it's it's a little early, but I think that's a, they're rel relatively pointed in the right direction. Maybe so. a different uh, question for you specifically is how concerned you about the impact all this will have on neighborhood? Yeah, well, certainly neighborhoods in the thick of things <laughs> because we essentially are two thirds of the Medicaid uh, population. Uh, we don't, we're not necessarily two-thirds of the spend because a lot of the spend is on some of the elder care and things of like that where we're just now getting into. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're concerned, obviously. We want to make sure that we can operate both financially sound as well as make sure we're making the investments to save money. Um, but we're a partner with the state, and we want to make sure that they're successful and they have long-term sustainability. Um, if the state continues to struggle, that means that it translates to difficulties for everybody. You saw, I'm sure we all saw, there was a new AARP report, Journal had a front page story on it this week about the apparent failure of Rhode Island to move more elderly population out of expensive nursing homes into more home care when they can. Um, you know, this is clearly a focus for state officials, including the governor on nursing home spending. Do you think the nursing homes will have to bear the brunt of the proposed cuts? I'm not sure if they have to bear the brunt, but they certainly have to partner with everyone else to make sure that we can achieve the savings. Um, that report, you know, certainly pointed us in an area that a lot of folks don't really talk about. Uh, certainly our elderly are the most frail and vulnerable parts of our population, but it's a significant portion of our spend. And we have to find ways to make sure that we provide the safety and the health care of those folks, but at the same time do it in a way that is cost effective. So 
I think it's going to be part of the solution. I'm not sure what it will translate to just yet, but I think we're, we're pointed in part of the solutions in that direction. And you hinted at this, but uh, neighborhoods core to one of the efforts to control that with this, I think it's called the Integrated Care Initiative. And it's, as I understand it, they basically, the state pays a monthly fee to neighborhood for some of these older Medicaid uh, recipients, and you're in charge of paying their medical, you're supposed to be in charge of paying their medical bills and their nursing home bills and coordinating everything. How is that going? Well, first of all, essentially what the idea is, there's a number of folks that are called dual eligibles. They receive resources from both Medicaid and Medicare. And right now, they're two distinct systems. They don't really talk to each other in a because lot of ways. Because just so people at home, I know it can be tough to follow. Medicaid is run by the states, but the feds pay half the money and have a lot of control. That's for lower income folks. Medicare is the classic uh, 65 and up health insurance program for seniors, which is different, though they right. can talk to each other. Right. So our challenge is, is that this, this is a very difficult population to manage. There's a lot of issues with disabilities mm -hmm. in terms of their needs and, and, and the health care um, demands. So our, we've been asked and we are partnering with the state to make sure that we can bring that together and pull them into managed care. That's the principle behind it. And use those two resources much more in an integrated way so that we can maximize the resources and make sure that they're getting the care they need. Now there's opportunities there and it's part of the relationship with the nursing homes is that there's opportunities for folks who aren't in nursing homes yet and perhaps we can find a more um, less restrictive setting for them in their home or in other alternative settings before they go in the nursing homes because nursing homes are the more expensive alternative. Mm -hmm. When they are ready for a nursing home that's when you need them and you have to make sure that they're providing the care that they need and I think they're in a good position to do that. The other is a, a great opportunity for savings is when folks are in the nursing homes oftentimes if something happens to them or if they have something they are typically sent pretty quickly to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. Well, there may be opportunities to provide that care right there in the nursing home rather than going back and forth in that transition between nursing homes and hospitals. And that report you referred to by the AARP talked a lot about the transitional costs associated with that, both for the emotional well-being of the patient, but also, more importantly, in terms of the price point that makes it difficult to manage. All right, only about a minute and a half or so left, so I gotta get through these quickly. Um, is neighborhood planning to shift um, fully away from fee for service at any point to just paying for whether the people stay healthy or not? Well, I think the better question is really, are we looking for newer ways to interact with our providers, new payment structures and things of that nature. Kind of like the, the soup du jour today is talking about bundled payments mm -hmm. and things like that. We're exploring those, we're working with the providers to see if we can come up with some really creative ways to incent the providers to save money but also provide real good quality care. Um, managed care, you've been around state budgeting a long time and it's been talked about and done for a long time and yet we're still talking about Medicaid problems. I think. Have, has med managed care been overrated, the amount it can do to bring down costs in the health system? No, I don't think so at all. I think part of it really is, is just you're talking about the sheer size of this industry. In Rhode Island alone, Medicaid is about two and a half billion dollars of the total budget, which is just over eight billion. So you're talking about a third of the spend is spent in this environment. And it's because 240 plus thousand folks in Rhode Island are eligible for these programs. So it is a big spend and that's why you have to pay attention to it. You wanna make sure that you, you know, contain costs but make sure that people are getting good access to good care. All right, uh, 10 seconds left. What are you excited about this year at, at Neighborhood? Neighborhood, uh, we're gonna to continue to grow but the most important thing is we have folks working at Neighborhood that are just absolutely mission driven. They think about the member and they understand that they have to contain costs so they can serve those members. So I'm excited about that. It's going to be a great year. All right. That's all the time we have this week. I want to thank Peter Marino for joining me, CEO and president of Neighborhood Health Plan. And if you're interested in all this, this week in our newsmakers, our sister show, we're going to have Elizabeth Roberts, Secretary of Health and Human Services. So you want to tune into that as well. Thanks for joining us as always and see you next week on Executive Suite. Perfect. That's also called a tease.